I also want to point out that um, really quickly that when I looked at Natalia and Carrie's blog, I agree that we don't have time to read everything, but even if you just scroll it really quickly, there are so many headers where you look at it you're like, that is so me, and you click on it, and then you look at it, and then you go look at the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. I'm interested in how your colleagues are perceiving the fact that you dedicate time to this. So I have an old school PI, and I just don't tell him. <laughs> it's a really short answer. I think he would tell me it's a distraction from science. But, you know, as a student or as a postdoc, we do have a certain amount of power. Like, they can't force me to do something. Okay, so I guess I'll start just introdu introducing by your room very briefly before giving the word to Jake. Um, for the new people here, Bio Room was started in April uh, because there was the lockdown and we wanted to hang out together to speak about science. So initially, it was just a um, seminar series where we would share our research and brief talks. Then for the second edition, we decided to um, expand our topics. So we did the part on career development that already finished, but we will upload all the talks and sessions on YouTube. So you can find um, all the other sessions, even if you miss them. And now we are doing a part on um, science communication. And I'm very happy today because we have two great um, invited speakers and Jake is chairing this session. So without further delay, I will just give the word to Jake and you can introduce our um, invited speakers. Thanks, Carmen. Um, yeah, as Carmen has mentioned, today we'll be talking about blogging and we have two very exciting individuals to talk about blogging. Um, they have a lot to offer and I won't take up too much more time. So first I'll introduce Natalia. Natalia has blogged over a decade now, and if I'm not mistaken, close to an impressive long 14 years. She has extensive experience of writing, communicating in general, and engaging with a number of professionals from academia to industry, facilitating her path towards business development. Natalia has also written a book on the landscape of career tracks post PhD, and I definitely look forward to more amazing material in the future. I'm sure this is a limited introduction and it will not suffice, so I'll hand this over to Natalia as she takes us through um, her blogging journey. So the virtual floor is all yours, Natalia. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, kindest introduction. Uh, thank you. I only have 20 minutes, so I'll, uh, don't spend too much time on talking about my story uh, here, but uh, I would like to briefly tell you in a few words uh, where I came from and uh, yeah, how it came about that I'm uh, blogging now. So actually, who am I? Uh, first of all, um, at the moment, I'm a director of a small foundation that is based here in the Netherlands. Um, it's actually a foundation I, I set uh, two years ago. It aims at helping researchers in uh, getting better mentoring and also in um, getting some direction in um, looking for the first job uh, jobs uh, in industry uh, after they decide to change the career tracks. And I also, last summer, over a year ago, I also set a little company, Welcome Solutions, that uh, the general aim of the company is to, uh, I, I, like, I like looking at this company not as a, a consultancy company, but rather as R&D company. So we are not only advising professionals and also with PhD how to find new careers and career paths for themselves, but we also work on new solutions and new tools uh, like aptitude tests and we do our own field research, and uh, and so I, I like looking at this as a, some form of an R and D company as well. Um, and also, uh, as uh, as mentioned before, I, I wrote a book and it's called "What Is Out There for Me: The Landscape of Post PhD Career Tracks." Uh, uh, and actually, second edition just came uh, came out recently. But I'm also writing my second book. Uh, it's going to be called about uh, the longest journey and about uh, general navigation on the job market but uh, I think it's coming out around summer next year. And uh, as mentioned uh, uh, as well, I'm also a blogger and uh, indeed I started this blog on a different platform and in a different language. So in Polish uh, 14 years ago when I was a sophomore student and uh, I didn't really think about this as, uh, you know, I, it was a hobby, but I never thought that it would uh, actually lasts for so long and, and yeah if you if you like to hear more like i don't have space here to talk about my story but i some time ago i recorded like a one hour long story for 
PhD career stories, and it's all all the way from from my childhood pretty much to all the way uh, up up until now. So if you're curious, then uh, you could just uh, take a look at this uh, podcast, and then every, every all the information is there. So how did the blogging start for me? Uh, between 2004 and 2011, I was an undergrad at the University of Warsaw. I was doing interfaculty studies, and I was studying a lot. So I was studying applied mathematics, medical physics, and psychometrics. And uh, I had this interfaculty study track, so I could combine subjects from different disciplines. So in the end, I took a lot, a lot of courses, and I ended up with three master titles. So I was very busy as a as a student. Nevertheless, I, I still uh, blogged uh, on the side. So in my free time, that was my way of relaxing. So instead of going to the park or going for a party, I was actually sitting down and I was, I was writing about whatever interested me. And at that point, it was mostly about psychology and human, you know, human perception and, and uh, sociology as well. Uh, I think this, this was the majority of the topics. Uh, and that's, you know, for me, that was also a way to relax because blogging is this, this one thing that you will never be graded for. So it was, on one hand, it was intellectually engaging. So it was not relaxing in that sense. But on the other hand, I knew that I would not, uh, yeah, this is something that no one judges uh, judges me for. And in that sense, I could actually do uh, do things my way and not be afraid of judgment. And actually my friends... Uh, who were uh, reading this blog, and they uh, they actually liked it a lot, so it was quite encouraging. Uh, and since then, since it started 14 years ago, I, I, um, I you know in preparation for the stock, I tried to analyze like what was the evolution of this blog. So I could say that there were like three distinct phases. So in the first phase, that was between 2006 and 2015. That was the first nine years. I was uh, writing in Polish. Uh, I was hosting the blog at the free website with uh, at Wikidot. That was the hosting platform that hosted the websites for free. And mostly, you know, since it was in Polish, it was mostly uh, read by my family and friends. And I, I was, yeah, mostly talking about psychology and sociology and, you know, like my private thoughts. Uh, and then um, in 2015, I decided to uh, upgrade the way the blog looks and also um, potential reach and potential potential audience by changing the language. I moved the blog to Squarespace and I started writing in English. And of course, given that change in language, then it was also visible to other people from outside my, my circle. And I, I could see that actually researchers in my own institute, but also in uh, institutes abroad, I could find it and actually enjoyed it because I... I'm again mixed topics because this time I was writing about I was a um, PhD student in neuroscience, so I also um, not only talked about psychology but also neuroscience, brain research, perception, and uh, the, this this kind of topic. So the blog not only attracted uh, um, my friends but also researchers in my field. Uh, but then in 2019, I basically became really heavily oriented at the analyzing the job market and then I, I it came to my mind that well I have to focus because the scope of topics I was uh, touching was very very broad so um, there was no like clear target group for the, for this blog and in the end in 2019 I decided okay well you have to if if you want this blog to bring you any further uh, you or your business then you have to actually focus on one topic so or at least a group of topics. So I decided that I'll uh, put a scope more on career development and job market, and also still um, productivity, psychology, that also, that's still there, uh, but uh, the profile is a little bit different. So I, I, my aim was to make it more useful for people who want to develop themselves as professionals and also get ideas about po possible f future jobs, but also how to increase their productivity today or the quality of life and so in general professionals who want to improve uh, and develop. I would like to briefly tell you a little bit about what I learned over all these years about blogging because maybe some of you consider whether or not uh, you should start your own blog and um, yeah it's actually there are lots of pros and lots of cons so like I would like to just list the things that I, I find most important or at least the things I, I noticed 
and hopefully it also helps you to make your own decision. Uh, so firstly, of course, uh, um, obvious uh, con is, is that um, these are non-billable working hours. And to write a blog post that is actually something new, create some, uh, contain some creative idea, and um, yeah, give some value to the reader, it's actually not as easy as just uh, sitting down in front of your computer and just writing a text. I mean, writing the text itself is maybe uh, two hours, but to actually have to get a concept and then let this concept grow in your head and, and then put it on paper and then polish it and just come back to it again and just make sure that it's uh, ready to go. It's actually in total at least few hours work. So if you want to uh, write a blog, you have to uh, take it into account that it's a lot of time and it's non billable working hours. So there is a, a like low number of people who can live off from writing blogs, but these are people who are extremely popular. And these pop and these blogs are typically in some uh, areas that are easier to monetize, like for instance, uh, lifestyle blogs, where you can pin your blog to Pinterest and to some YouTube channel, and then basically this traffic kind of grows throughout different platforms and and then there are natural sponsors because like there are companies that are interested in like putting their brand on the blog so there are other streams of income then so from readership itself it's very hard to get any income so from the very start it's better to actually take into account that it will be something you only do for your own satisfaction or for building your network or building your personal brand but definitely not for uh, income so don't i wouldn't expect to uh, to actually convert blog into into income and second thing is this thing that i actually like to call uh, ouroboros effect that means if you some if you really enjoy do, doing something uh, it's a hobby for you you really feel relaxed doing it then once you convert it into a project and you treat it as a part of your professional activities, then it might uh, become as joyful because then you have to think about uh, practicalities. Like, so for instance, you, once, in, once upon a time you were writing because you liked it and you write, uh, you wrote whenever you felt like so, but now you, you have a plan that every week you will put, uh, you will, uh, put out like a new blog post. So you have to have a plan, you have to have a schedule, you have to, you have to diversify uh, what you do, the, the different topics, so you have to think about the plan ahead and, you know, it, it might become less joyful in the process. So a lot of people actually report that problem that once they try to convert their hobby into something that builds up to their career, then all of a sudden the level of um, joy actually drops, so that you have to be aware of that. And there is this race for attention, of course, like, especially nowadays, um, like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first uh, started writing, uh, blogs were like, blogs were like, as just like uh, online news newspapers, they were just a natural way for people to um, just spend, you know, procrastinate, right? Now people procrastinate on YouTube or procrastinate on Instagram, they, they are not that willing to uh, focus their attention on like a longer form of te like written text. So you have much more competition and it's really um, uh, not good market for bloggers because indeed like human attention span dropped and today people actually um, prefer, most people prefer to, to, uh, to choose audiovisual content rather than uh, like audiobooks and indeed YouTube movies rather than uh, written text. And um, so it's, it's harder now to get an audience for your blog for obvious reasons. So you have to be also prepared for that, that you might produce a quality content and figure out that there are like people still prefer to choose for more like um, brainless activities. Even, even if you, if they like your content, they would still, they would still choose for something else. So there's, this is something that unfortunately probably is not going to change anytime soon. Also, you've got to be focused. That's something I, I also learned in the process that even if you write very interesting things, uh, but it's like just your own point of view, it doesn't, it's not focused on any particular topic, then you won't have much audience because then mostly people who know you uh, will be interested in where you are going next. Unless you're someone really famous like Joe Rogan, like whatever he says would be interesting to a lot of people, right? Because he's Joe Rogan. But 
if you're not Joe Rogan, then you have to choose some topic. Otherwise, um, uh, people people have to know what they look, what they will find on your blog, uh, and then and then you can um, count on the uh, returning uh, users. But also like one thing that I didn't mention here, you have to also be uh, familiar with SEO, with the search engine optimization. You have to be just aware that uh, yeah, you have to you have to uh, be aware of what this is. And, uh, and 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 learn something about it because the the sooner you do it the better for your blog because there are certain tricks you can use to actually get more organic traffic and unfortunately these days grow um, the most blogs mostly grow through organic traffic so you have to also learn how to speak to uh, google machines because without that just by creating interesting content it's really hard to be noticed so you have to also take that into account. But now a little bit about the pros. So like what you actually can gain out of out of blog, since you know I'm doing this, so there must be some pros. So first thing is, well, if you ever thought about writing books, then this is a playground for a homegrown author. So if you if you you know this is the best way. I mean to to um, to learn about writing, you have to write a lot. And this is actually short form, so every blog post is maybe two to four pages of text. So it's a short form, um, closed form. And once you do it uh, once you do it uh, on a regular basis, you will see the improvement in your quality of writing. And I could even see that this year. Like this year, I was actually releasing posts every week, and I could see that now when I go through uh, the book I released in December, I could spot some little mistakes that I couldn't ever notice before, just because I, I wrote so much text this year. And it's a, uh, once you do it systematically over a few years, then you will also get your uh, unique style of writing, which is like priceless. So if you ever think about, uh, think about ever start uh, be becoming an author, that this is a good playground. Second, uh, it's also a documentation on, on, of what you are interested in. So that, for me, that also helped me make a decision of what to do next with my career because I actually, at some point I went back through my blog and I uh, went through all the posts I wrote during the graduate school and I could see that, well, without any constraints when I could uh, write about just anything, I was mostly writing about human, like um, about sociology, about the, uh, uh, like crowd behavior about the job market about like things that had little to nothing to do with my phd and i was like hey if you if you have free time and no one tells you what to do this is what you're interested in so that's your natural interest so you should do more about this and so i could actually see a log of what i was mostly concerned about in all these years and uh, that that helped me also see myself more objectively and the next thing is for some people, writing is relaxing. For me, it's relaxing. I have a flow. I just uh, sit down and time passes by very quickly. So if you're, just, if you're the type of person who relaxes by writing, then blogging is perfect because this is just, uh, this is just uh, a quality time then. Of, of course, also freedom of speech is very, very important. So this is this form where unless you say something that is clearly, you know, inappropriate, um, it's, it's obvious that this, this is your own uh, these are your own opinions, so yeah, there is a, there is a lot of flexibility there. No one censors you. So I, actually, I like that that I can speak out my mind, and um, as 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 long as I'm kind, then I can actually express my opinions. And like no one, there is no editor there who will just uh, tell me, you know, ah, you have to uh, you have to redo this or that. I can actually say what I what I uh, want to say. So if you if you want, are one of these people who actually really enjoy uh, speaking out their mind their own way, then this is a good platform. And also sometimes you have these creative ideas that just uh, get, like appear and then disappear, right? And this is like maybe too little to convert it into a book or an article. It's just, just one creative thought. And then it's either that you take this thought and you uh, do something about it quickly, so write it down, uh, or it disappears and it just never comes back. So this is actually also a way to not let your creative uh, thoughts die in the process. What I can also say is that interesting people come to my life because once in a while someone uh, reads my some of my blog posts and then and they contact me and they're like, this is very interesting what you said, like I agree with this or I disagree uh, or they just uh, have some other questions. And 
some people through my blog find the YouTube channel or find my company and this is basically a part of um, yeah it's just a creates a flow people can find you and some of these people are really very interesting people so so uh, I think I, I met a, a lot of new interesting people I didn't have access to before just because of, of the blog and lastly I, I have a, I always had a gut feeling that this is uh, good for me that this is actually uh, I will never really lose anything from blogging but I, I can uh, gain a lot in the long run and Sometimes it's good to go with this gut feeling. So uh, just do the things, even if you don't have like a clear plan of how you might potentially benefit from this at the moment, then still do them just because uh, it feels right. And so I, I basically, I, I, I try to do that, just uh, use intuition and do what feels right. All right, and actually I think I'm running out of time. So lastly, yeah, thank you for your attention. And indeed my, <laughs> my book, uh, the second edition just came out. So you might be willing to take a look if you actually, indeed, if you're uh, interested in potential alternatives to your um, academic career path, then this is a huge uh, amount of information. And, um, and yeah, uh, please, uh, I, I, can, I can take any questions you might have about blogging and whereabouts. I'll give a virtual uh, round of applause because um, it might get too loud if there's too many people. Um, so I guess I'll start with a question first. I'm sure there will be a lot of uh, people who will think of similar, things that you've just mentioned. And I fully agree with that table that you've just shown, you know, it's, um, I think everything, you know, I, I agree with all of that. So I guess with your identity now that you own a company, and I know that you use your blog as a platform to extend that as well. How do, how do you use blogging to actually build it into your career nowadays? Because I know that blog is personal, but at the same time, I know that you're trying to use it for your business development and, and career as well. Well, it's uh, actually in many ways. So, um... One way is to basically, like when you uh, think about um, blog posts, you can also think about, because I always, you know, when you do business, you have to really think about like five or 10 or 15 steps in advance. So people actually are, you know, buying your first book and you're already writing a second one or a third one, you know, it's like you always, uh, you are always ahead and a few projects ahead. And what you, what is on the social media is not your actual like reality because you're already doing new stuff. Like I'm now, now producing an online course and doing a lot of other things like aptitude tests, etc. So uh, when you have a blog, you can give a snippet of, uh, of the upcoming projects and get people interested in these projects before they are even there. Uh, or you can also, uh, when you, for instance, think about something, some longer form that you're going to write next, like a next book, let's say, then you can actually um, take some seeds of good ideas and just unfold them into blog, uh, blog posts. So it's indeed this short form and then just unfold it farther in a book. So this, these are actually these seeds that will be the building components for some chapters of the next book. So it's actually a blog is a good way of start, you know, of starting these subjects. And also you can see then if, if people like them, right? So what mm -hmm. kind of comments they give you and, which of these concepts they find the most interesting and uh, so you know also from from the feedback from the first book i i i really see that certain piece of it pieces of it um, in general readers found us like most interesting and i i would i wouldn't even guess you know that my perception of this book was a little bit different and s certain things that i wrote in it um, um people who read it they didn't really f actually they were they were um uh, very um, happy. I mean, for me, certain things I wrote were obvious, and I just wrote them because I thought everyone knows this. But for the records, I have to, you know, write them down. But uh, the readers were actually very happy about this piece of information. So sometimes, you know, you have to collect feedback because what other people find interesting is not necessarily, or the most interesting is not necessarily what you find interesting. So a blog is um, a form also of like communicating with the audience. Uh, and again, this is like a part of a uh, infrastructure. So I also, this year, I started a little YouTube channel, which was actually originally, I was planning to do one-on-one -on -one, uh, interviews with PhDs in industry and then uh, putting these interviews on the company website. But then uh, I realized that the hosting plan cannot really, uh, you know, my hosting plan doesn't really allow for hosting so much video. So 
I put them on YouTube and then it turned out that people like these uh, these interviews. So at the moment, um, there is like an increasing amount of subscribers and the uh, amount of uh, like hours that are, you know, watched hours, they builds up very quickly. And, uh, and I can see that from there, people also find my blog and from my blog, people also find this channel. And it's like, a, it's a part of the infrastructure. So it's not only, it's, I, I think to build, uh, if, especially if you don't have any resources, any like financial, you know, and, any investment, investors, any, any um, financial resources, then to start a company that is actually offering services online, Actually, the best way is to basically have an infrastructure of a few means of communication with the potential clients yeah. and readers that are on a few different platforms. And blog is just one of them at the moment. Um, does anyone have any questions? Because I, I probably have one that's quite relevant to um, other people here as well, because you also have a PhD in neuroscience. <laughs> um, and, but if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free to pop in. Uh, Carmen? Or... I have one. Um, I'll show you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. So my question is, uh, what do you, what would you recommend to people that start writing a blog uh, between uh, having, you know, the chance of being hosted in a, maybe in a larger website or in a larger, you know, like a website that hosts blogs for more people and maybe there's already a brand on its own uh, or just, you know, uh, having the chance of uh, hosting your own blog on your own uh, website so that it is more directly linked to your name and uh, well, and your face and whatever. Yeah, actually, good question. That's, um, I think there are also ways that are kind of between the two. So a lot of people actually like this medium model where when you write on medium, then you can commercialize your posts. So then you can submit your posts to publications and then there are groups that are like managing these publications and if they accept your publication then you have exposure and then you can you can actually earn money from it even if you don't submit you can technically earn money from it because then if you get followers on medium then um, yeah you can you can actually have a grow, growing audience for me actually that was a good like that was quite a dilemma actually i was advised by quite a few people to uh, switch to medium because then i could um, monetize what i write um, hmm. quicker but my like again it was more about gut feeling that hmm. i had a gut feeling that i need this freedom and i need to be able to do with my blog whatever i want and you know if you have your own blog you can do a lot of things around it so for instance Oh, one thing I have to advise you: if you if you think about your own blog, use outro, use WordPress rather than buy into Squarespace or all these. Because I'm I actually this is one thing I regret um, because they are not very custom, so you cannot really program much around it. So whatever template you get, there is not much you can do about it, and I don't think there are enough options. And in WordPress, you can install all kinds of packages, and then if you have enough readership and audience, then you can also recommend um, uh, products through Amazon. You can uh, you can like uh, write an ebook and just put it on the website to buy as a PDF, you know, and everything you can do through WordPress that you you, you cannot do by one of these like ready to go uh, uh, custom friend like uh, customer friendly websites like Squarespace. So. Like in my case, I chose for the most freedom, and I knew that this is like much longer way than if you go for medium or if you write in a group of other people. But it's just uh, it's just me. Like I don't say that this is the best solution, and a lot of people are happy with medium, for instance. Um, I just I just knew that once I post there, it's like it's not my piece of internet, you know. It's not not not, not my soil. Then I'm a medium writer. I'm not uh, myself myself. So I was like, okay, I can give up on a little bit of income just because I want to have my own website. And I, I feel that in the long run, it might just be better. But, but there's not, not one answer to this question. Good, thanks. I have a very, I have a very um, personal curiosity. First of all, thank you for the presentation and for all the tips. It was great. Um, I've never blogged, so probably when I was 15, but I was like really not blogging. Um, and hopefully it has been deleted from the net. But anyway, so uh, thinking about, you said that at the beginning you were um, blogging in Polish and then you switched to English to increase your audience. And 
as Italian, I was thinking, even if I have a good English, but then writing in English about personal stuff or other things um, would be a bit more difficult for me to to have my because you you also sp- spoke about a person having a personal style of writing i don't know how i can have a personal style of writing in a language which is not my own um was it difficult for you to start that yeah actually it was i think it's also that i don't i don't think that i have natural talent for uh foreign languages some people have like a more talented uh, much more talented than me Actually, currently I go. Uh, I actually attend the Dutch course because I finally have to uh, learn Dutch, and it's a it's a it's a tragedy. It's really uh, it's awful. And I I know uh, with English I also I don't have probably that level of proficiency when I could like feel every little nuance in what I see when I what I say. But for most readers, it's good enough. And yeah, I I could also see that when when I first released my book last year. Actually, then I had to edit it after it was already released because some people were telling me, hey, like you have to improve because, you know, it's like what they expect from you uh, language wise when you write this type of open form like a blog is actually they have higher expectations than if you write research articles. Like if you write research articles, I was always praised by editors for my English when I was um, when I was uh, submitting my manuscripts. But I could see like from the example of my book that you know, sometimes, yeah, it, it requires some extra attention to, yeah, it, actually, when people r- read blogs or like self-help books, they really expect you to have proficiency on the like, native level. I think I really improved a lot this year. And now I trust myself much, much, much more. I think with the next book, I will still uh, have like a native read it before I release it. But I think I'm close now to being completely independent. But uh, it took a long time. Sorry, what is a long time? Because I, my question was the same one. So I want to know how much like time and effort you really need to put to. I mean, I, it sounds stupid, but 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 uh, it's something I, I'm also worried about personally because I love writing in Spanish, but not not in English. I hate it. Right. Actually, it depends also on your uh, focus. So in the last uh, years, I was focused on writing, but I didn't really focus that much on polishing my writing. And it's only this year that I paid more attention because of the book. And then I started writing with, uh, uh, working with programs like Grammarly that basically show you where your little mistakes are. And it basically underlines your, like in red, it underlines like mistakes, but it also underscores the stylistic little mistakes or like if your sentence is too long. So all these little things. And I started really writing, like working with my text much more than before to actually uh, make sure that it's perfect before uh, yeah, so it's, uh, there are no uh, errors whatsoever. And once I started, and then rereading it a few times. So I, this year I just paid more attention and then the progress was, was quite fast. So I think if you, if you really pay attention and use these programs and reread the text a few times before, and sometimes it's good to reread it the next day after you rested, like have a sleep overnight and then first thing in the morning, read it again and then you will see your uh, mistakes or you know, what what you could uh, still polish. Uh, and, and now I think, you know, so even a few months is already good enough if you actually pay attention, I would say. And maybe sometimes, you know, again, and uh, take feed- feedback because you might have some peculiarities in your language that you, 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 you don't see, but other people will see it. So if you just give it to your friends to read it, they will tell you what what are your, like, like, re- like returning, uh, like, rare... Uh, elements in your writing right yeah. thank you natalia that was great tip uh we're so in my uh thanks for all that questions it's really interesting to hear different perspectives especially the english part because um i definitely forgot about that at some point sometimes i get asked do you count in like what do you count in your head when you dream i don't know anymore <laughs> um but we'll see anyway um so thanks again natalia that was really great um so Next up, it's definitely a great pleasure to introduce Carrie, who is going to tell us about her blog, um, Bold at Science, really bold. And I do think it's really amazing because it's one of a kind. It collaborates, it's a written form of science communication that collaborates with other researchers. So I think that's really amazing. And my first vivid impression of this aesthetically pleasing blog, I think was only surpassed by her creative content. And I think she brought to life 
a lot of stories from other bloggers and which by my count about an hour ago was 26 alone this year. I could be wrong. Um, I was one of them. So Carrie will be sharing with us her experience as a blogger in grad school. And I think that's really exciting because I had the same thought as well um, last year during my PhD. And uh, I look forward to a lot more from Carrie. Over to you, Carrie. Great. Right. Thank you, Jake. And thank you, Natalia. It's really impressive that you've been blogging for 14 years. I've only been blogging for one year. <laughs> so my experience is a little bit more limited. But hopefully I have some good tips that I can share with you. So like Jake said, my name is Kerry. Um, I am a PhD candidate at the University of Connecticut, which is in America. And I am a biochemist and a cancer researcher. So specifically right now I'm studying how um, certain proteins can bring about cancer chemotherapy resistance. Um, and I love being a scientist, but I like writing and science communication even more. Um, I am the creator, editor, and author of the blog Bolded Science, which is turning almost a year old in a couple of weeks. So if you um, want to either follow me or get in contact with me, uh, the blog that I have is boldedscience.com. My uh, website is boldedscience.com. Uh, the email for this uh, website is theboldedscientist.com. And I have two Twitter handles, a personal one and also my uh, blog Twitter handle. So you can follow me or check me out on any of those uh, platforms. So my website, Bolted Science, is a collaborative blog for members of the scientific community. So anybody who considers themselves a scientist is welcome to email me and pitch a blog post and write for my blog. So it's not just me running, uh, writing for the website. So I have two goals on my website. The first is to pro provide a platform for scientists to communicate with one another. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later why I decided to um, choose to create a platform and not just a blog for myself. And the second is to enable scientists to gain experience with informal public writing. So a lot of us here are academics or at least got their start in academia. And we become really good at writing these formal research articles. And uh, writing informally has a different nuance to it. And it's really great to be able to practice informal writing. So my desire to blog probably started around my second year of my PhD, where I was spending a lot of time at the bench and I wasn't writing at all. And this was a stark contrast to my master's degree where I felt like I was writing all the time. So um, even sometimes when I would start writing emails, I started realizing how um, rusty my writing skills were getting. And I really needed to find an opportunity to practice writing more. Um, and I'm interested in a career in science communication. And I've had uh, science writers, medical science liaisons, and people who work in science policy all give me the same advice and that was if you want to work in these fields you need to start writing and you need to write more than just uh, formal academic articles so find opportunities to write um, and blogging also gives you variety in your work so I'm a biochemist and I study one protein and I know how this protein interacts with other proteins and how it folds and I write and I read about the same protein every single day and it's really exciting to be able to um, read about other uh, parts of science, talk about bigger stories instead of just this one little protein that I work on. And that's really sparked my interest in science again. And lastly, um, I really want to fight information on misinformation on the internet. So, um, you know, all of these people who believe in, um, you know, not Eastern medicine or anti-vaxxers and, you know, that whole field of thought these people are out there blogging. So it's important that we blog too, and that we get in the internet and we speak like normal people instead of high-end scientists in order to help fight this misinformation. So why did I make my uh, blog collaborative instead of just having, you know, kerrymcpherson.com? So one of my goals was that I really wanted to have a steady stream of content. And very early on, it was very obvious to me that I would not have the time to do that. And I also wanted to have a variety of content I'm a biomedical scientist and I study cancer. I wanted to touch on more topics than just cancer biology in my blog. So inviting others to write for me allows me to have more variety about my science writing. And lastly, I wanted to provide an opportunity for scientists who were like me. So when I first got at Twitter, I was looking for opportunities to write informally, like the other, um, like the advice that I received. And it was hard to find other blogs or websites to write for without prior experience or without having to pay for them. Like I found a couple of websites that said that I could 
write for them, but I would have to pay them to write, which was very counterintuitive to me. Um, so I just decided to go ahead and make my own platform and invite other scientists to write who are interested in doing so, like myself. So how does my website work? So we post weekly, although I do schedule in vacations for myself so that way I don't get overwhelmed. And it's really simple. If you are interested in writing, you just email me at thebolded.scientist.com and you just have to say a couple of sentences pitching your blog post and what you're interested in. And you can write about science, you can write about being a scientist, you can write about career development, so on and so forth. I mostly approve every topic, unless if someone's already written about that topic or has already pitched that topic. And then we'll choose a publish date, and then the authors um, will send me their completed work two weeks before their publish date. And then we will edit the piece back and forth on a Google document, um, so that way we can um, edit it together so it looks professional enough to put up on the website. Oh, and uh, I'm now accepting pitches for 2021. I'm full for the rest of the year, um, but I haven't tweeted this out yet. So as of now, all my 2021 dates are free. So if you're interested or if you know someone else who's interested, you can certainly email me and reach out to me. Okay, so um, now that I have explained what Bolded Science is, I'm going to share what I've learned from running, running and writing uh, for Bolded Science and um, just share a few tips about running a blog and getting a blog started as well as writing blog posts. Um, so I think before you start writing, uh, it's a good idea to do some research and read other people's blogs. And I did this before I started Bolded Science, and this is how I learned how I wanted to tailor my blog posts, by just reading other people's blogs, figuring out what I like, and figuring out what I don't like. So um, I liked blogs that were like polished and professional looking, even though it is informal, that doesn't mean it can't be um, well executed. And I also learned that I didn't like posts that were just super, super, super long. There were so many blog posts that I started reading and I gave up halfway through. So I learned from that to keep my posts a little bit shorter. Um, another thing that's really interesting that I've been doing a little bit more in Twitter is that there are plenty of blogs out there that you can collaborate with if you're interested in blogging. So bloggers, I think, are pretty friendly people. We're out on the internet because we want to connect with people. So if you want advice, just message them on Twitter. They are more than happy to talk to you. Um, there are a few other bloggers that I've collaborated with and cross-promoted with. So don't look at other bloggers as your competition. Like we're all in a community and we're all interested in, in uh, promoting ourselves. Also, before you start writing, consider uh, the brand of your blog and the overall theme of your blog. So it's kind of cohesive and it has a feel to it that is welcoming to your audience. So Natalia um, touched on this a little bit, but I think it's a good idea to find your niche and to find a good topic and to keep it a little bit focused. I come across a lot of bloggers who are aspiring writers who just say, hi, I'm so-and-so and I write about everything. I write recipes, lifestyle, politics, my personal life, blah, blah, blah. Like you, and I think she said, yeah, like if you're Joe Rogan, you can pull that off. You know, if you're like Kim Kardashian or Meghan Markle and you already have a name and people are interested in you. Yeah, you can do that, but you know, you're a graduate student, I don't know <laughs> how popular you actually are. Um, I'm not that popular, so I couldn't do that. Um, it's, in, it's important to uh, figure out your target audience. Um, are they educated? Are you trying to communicate uh, your science to a more general audience? Because that's going to um, tailor into the type of tone, the type of language you use, and the way that you design your blog. Decide on a tone early on so you can have like cohesiveness to your blog. Are you professional? Are you sarcastic? Are you formal? Are you fun? Um, that will help you tailor the topics and the type of language you want to use when you write. And then once you figure all that out, it's a good idea to then figure out your website design and the color scheme you use, the name you use, and so on and so forth should tie into all the decisions that you made up here. So for my blog, for example, it's called Bolded Science because I envision that the scientist who would write for the blog would be opinionated and would have a personality. So we were being bold as opposed to being the bland academic writers that we have to be in our professional lives. And then I chose the color scheme purple and yellow because those are bold colors that stand out and aren't often used in other logos. Um, so for running a blog, before we even get to the writing part of it, um, obviously you do want to build a following. Uh, the following might come slowly and that's fine. You might put out a decent amount of content that you don't get a ton of writers for and that is okay. Um, as you build your content, the following should be able to come along with it. 
Twitter is my favorite um, platform to promote myself. It's the way that I've gotten the most success. Um, but the best way to build a following is to engage with the target audience, to engage with their tweets, to talk to them, and so on and so forth. I think it's a good idea to create a realistic schedule so you're consistent. Um, I once spoke to another blogger who wrote daily for about like a month and then just like gave up and had to take three months off because it drove him crazy. And it was, of course you did. That's not sustainable. So um, I post weekly with vacations. If I was the only person writing for my site, I probably wouldn't be writing weekly. I don't think I would be able to sustain that. So create a realistic schedule that works for you and your work-life balance. And then lastly, it's important to promote yourself. And this is something I struggled with at first where I had, I wasn't sharing my blog on my personal socials because I was a little bit, had a little bit of lowest self esteem about my writing and like sharing this to people who knew who I was. I was fine sharing to strangers, but my own coworkers and friends and family, I was a little bit nervous of. And that I was able to shake that about a few months into working on my blog. And I just recommend that if you plan on blogging, go in head first. You're going to get more followers if you promote yourself and the people who like you are going to be um, supportive of your work. Um, so I only have a few tips for writing posts because I think that um, blogging is a creative enterprise and there's quite a few different ways you can go about doing it. But early on, I definitely learned that um, it's best to write a light and enjoyable post. So um, the way I keep my posts light so they're easy to read is I try to keep them about under 1200 words, which even some bloggers would consider that to be long. Um, I use bullets, numberings, and um, subheadings. So if you have someone reading and they get distracted, they have focal points that they can come back to. So just remember that most of the people interacting with your blog are probably interacting with you through social media. They might be on their phone. They might be on an elevator or on a train. You know, they might not have 15 minutes to dedicate to a really dense, jargon-heavy read. And Natalia uh, also touched upon this. Um, your blogs should be, uh, put the right amount of time into your blogs. Uh, and it's more than just writing. So you have to come up with a concept. It should still be well-researched, even if it is just your opinion that you're sharing online. You should have reputable sources that back it up. Um, so put the correct amount of time in so you have a well-researched and polished post. And lastly, just make sure your posts are enjoyable. And the way that I um, tell my writers is the easiest to make your posts enjoyable is to really just put your personality into your writing. Again, like as academics, we don't always have an opportunity to do that. Uh, blogging is creative and we can, um, you know, show, our, show off our personality. We can be sarcastic. We can be funny. Uh, we can be combative if that's what you would go for. I usually don't go for that tone, but uh, just consider ways to make it more enjoyable and not just a flat read. Um, so then lastly, all I want to do is share a few posts with you that um, we have done on Bolted Science, which were some of my favorites. So on Bolted Science, we talk about all different kinds of science. But my favorite posts are about scientists, so about the people who conduct the science, and about evidence-based policy. So um, just as an example, this is the post Jake did that I actually really liked. Uh, so he wrote, did I choose science or did it choose me? And pretty much it's a story about how he kind of fell into science. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't born with a diehard passion for science that made him want to be a scientist. And I think a lot of scientists can resonate with this, that um, they found their passion after choosing their major and so on and so forth. Um, this post by Nisa, um, she's written for me a couple of times. She's written a couple of good posts. She wrote about mentoring and about how mentoring is the backbone of science. But unfortunately, we don't take mentoring too seriously and that we should put more effort into formally learning how to mentor. And then this was a pretty creative post done by Jeffrey Letourneau, who's a PhD student at Duke. And he actually um, reached out to people on Twitter who were doing fun um, experiments at home during lockdown. And he uh, wrote a really good story about how a lot of professors kind of felt not at home, not being in labs. So they found creative ways to bring the lab home with them. Um, and then as for posts about evidence-based policy, this is actually one of our most successful posts we've ever done where it's, this is a colleague of mine at UConn, Ani, who in layman's terms described how mathematical modeling of COVID-19 disease spread works and how we can use that math modeling to influence our policies about the pandemic. Uh, this is a shameless self-plug for myself. I wrote this article <laughs> and it's, um, 
a post pretty much where I argue that a lot of the attitudes that we take for handling COVID-19 should also be used to talk about climate change and that proactivity is better than retroactivity. And then lastly, this post could be good um, for many people in the audience if you're interested in science communication. It's written by um, Linda, who is a graduate student in Ireland, who is a huge advocate for inclusivity of uh, disabled students. And she um, shares tips of how to make science communication that's accessible for people with disabilities. Um, so this was a really, really, um, it was a helpful post for me and I actually tailored my blog a little bit differently um, to make sure that was more accessible to people who have um, vision impairment, for example. And um, that's all I wanted to share for today. Just again, I have my contact information here if anybody wants to reach out to me after all this is done. Thank you, Carrie. You're welcome. I'll, I'll, I'll do the applause because uh, I might as well. I'm already here. Um, so <laughs> I, if anyone has questions, uh, feel free to raise their hands. But I, I also want to point out that um, really quickly that when I looked at Natalia and Carrie's blog, just even I agree that we don't have time to read everything, but even if you just scroll it really quickly, there's so many headers where you look at it, you're like, that is so me. And you click on it and then you look at it and then you go look at the next one and the next one and the next one and the next one. Um, I think they have really a lot of like variety of topics. Um, I even shared the parenting and research um, the week before because we had a session on parenting and academia, which is obviously tough. Uh, but that's just my shout out. I'm not being biased, just saying. Um, so, Anyone has any uh, burning questions or comments before I say anything? I have a question. So this is for Curry, but, but also for Natalia, actually. I'm interested in how your colleagues are perceiving the fact that you dedicate time to this. And I, I am saying this because I don't know many PIs that are, I, I know some, okay. There are some of them that they do, but it's like something that you cannot find that much on PI. So I, I was wondering if uh, how that is perceived because for me it looks like a great idea, something good. But but I was asking more about old school people. Let's say how, how they perceive that. So I have an old school PI, and I just don't tell him. <laughs> it's a really short answer. I think he would tell me it's a distraction from science. But you know, as a student or as a postdoc, we do have a certain amount of power. Like they can't force me to do something during my spare time. I can't get fired. I've already passed my prelim. Like the way I see it, this is part of my education because I want to be a science communicator. So I don't know if Natalia has anything to add to that. Well, actually, um, I just graduated from my PhD and at the moment I am my own boss. But like in my PhD, I was, uh, you know, I had very liberal and uh, like not involved PhD advisor. If I could uh, describe him, him in one word, it would be not present. So like he he didn't really bother about what I'm doing, which was more of a problem than uh, uh, you know. Uh, but I think you know one thing that you have to learn, and I think you learn it for like your whole future online, is to be um, diplomatic, and you have to you know it's it's sometimes it's a. I also had to learn it in the beginnings because when I was still writing in Polish for the first few years, like. I know that my sense of humor can be edgy sometimes and I sometimes I was on the right side. You have to balance on the air sometimes and sometimes I was on the wrong side and my friends were calling me, come on, like just take this off because this is just, you know, uh, you have to take this text off. It cannot be just, uh, you know, aired publicly. And, and then for the first few years I had to learn like where are the boundaries and sometimes, you know, you have to find this uh, optimum when you say something in your own style and it can be funny, it can be engaging, but it doesn't offend anyone and it doesn't create some, uh, you know, a really fishy association. So I think, uh, and in that case, if you have that, you uh, work out that style and then no one can really tell you, I mean, that you do something wrong, right? Because it's your own time. So who can actually, who can tell you that you cannot do it? Nobody. Yeah, no, no, I know they can. It's like more the perception, what I was like wondering. Yeah. If they see that, like more like a, waste of time or if they say oh look what they're you are doing and, and, yeah. and that's what Kerry was like saying a bit that, that what they would think sorry i also think you hit the nail on the head when you asked about more old pis or classical pis because i do think that nowadays also 
um, it's very well perceived to do outreach scientifically also for increasing chances of getting grants and stuff. So I feel like the younger PIs are definitely more open to it as long as you're not doing it under their time. <laughs> I think that's the caveat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but the people who will hire you later in comedy will, they all will have a lot to say. That's why I was my question. I, I think Jake also has. Actually, yeah. if I could add something to this, uh, actually, my, my recent uh, discovery also, not only from blog, but from the YouTube channel as well, is that, like, I was afraid that, you know, you know, you, once you're out there, especially showing your face, but also writing, um, you expose yourself to a lot of problems, all this online hate and all this, you know, also indeed backfire from, from your superiors, whatever. But I, I, my finding was that actually the amount of benefits you get and the privilege that you get from being a noticeable is actually much higher. And actually it was the other way around. So some people who were um, very, very unpleasant to me during my PhD, now once my network is growing, they all of a sudden became super nice. <laughs> so it was exactly the opposite. Actually, I um, just recall something, but um, Carrie, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think your first advisor during your master's actually is a very supportive PI. She appreciates the art of writing. You know, some people see writing as like an art and other people see it as a necessary evil to do science. So, um, you know, it does help if you have a supportive PI, but if you don't have a supportive PI, you know, you have to look out for yourself. <laughs> if I can add something, I think I think Natalia touched a very important both that Carrie and Natalia that you have to look out for yourself and then time is yours, which is something that especially for early career researcher, I wanna stress this point because sometimes when when we started a PhD, we were thinking, well, whatever we do in our life, it it is like we have to deal with our PIs and we have to ask for permissions, even for things that we don't really need to ask for permission. I know that Carmen, this was not your question, but it's always good to remind people that you can do whatever you want with your free time. And as far as it does not impact the work, they cannot really tell you anything. Even if sometimes they perceive it as a waste of time, we should not care. So I totally agree with your... No, I agree with that, to be honest, yeah. No. No, I was just commenting on the chat that if people hate you on internet, it's because you made it. I have to say that one of my favorite moments for my blog was when a Trump supporter commented on my climate change post. I felt like I made it when that happened. Oh. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, had that. the orange badge. <laughs> Thanks for the people of the, from the people of the future for doing that. that. No, I, I, I actually wanted to ask another question to Kerry because um, to she um, writes about something that I'm interested in too. That it's um, I'm interesting. I'm interested about uh, pseudosciences and and how that is entering medicine and how risky it is. So I'm a member of the Spanish Association for uh, uh, the the protection of patients from pseudotherapies. That's that's the name. It, the name is in Spanish, obviously, but that's like I'm a member of that. And uh, I have friends that are bloggers in, in, in Spain and they touch on this topic and they are threatened many times and they some of them even finish like finish in, in the trial like in and, and everything. They were they were absolved obviously but but I know that there's also like that part. So I was wondering if you touching these topics ever experienced anything like that. Um I haven't as of yet. The only like really blatant one I got was uh, that climate change denier. Um I don't have a ton of posts that talk about that, even though it's something I should do a little bit more. Um, like I had one post that was against vaccination. I mean, against vaccinations, for vaccinations, <laughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, so I haven't had many people that are are really like hating on my blog posts. I haven't had a lot of conflict as of yet, I would say. I also have a question. So I think it's very interesting because, so whereas Natalia's, um, kind of gist that I got from it was more like stay focused. Um, I feel like you, Carrie, in what you presented is because you have this consortium going on, it's very broad within science outreach, right? Right. So how do you have a way how you uh, profile yourself uh, for that or how you spread your word about what you're doing because it's quite broad? Or yeah, um, so... I pretty much like have just the brand that it's scientists telling stories and I don't cater to one um, area over another. I will say that I have more biomedical scientists who write for me probably because 
not even purposefully, my branding goes towards that more because I'm a biomedical scientist. Um, so for the most part, I do use Twitter um, to reach out to other people. And if you really want to get a reach, you just got to use the good hashtags. That's going to get you retweets. That's really what it comes down to. I have been trying to reach more of a general audience, especially for the posts that are about climate change, evidence-based policy, and vaccines, so that way they can read up on that. And I find that the more the posts that are geared towards more of a general population, Facebook is actually better for that um, okay. because Twitter is so large and there's all these like little communities with inside Twitter. Whereas in Facebook, I'll have friends and families retweeting to friends and families to re- uh, friends and families. So you would basically link on Facebook through to what your website hosts as posts and then yeah. you get yeah. some visibility through that. Or right. Anything. And um, yeah, so I'll share um, my Twitter is the most followed. I don't have a lot of followers on Facebook and LinkedIn. That's definitely a weak spot for me. But then I'll share to my personal page and then I have a decent amount of followers on my personal page. And I've definitely noticed that when my writers, because I share everything to both my personal and my professional page, but when my writers promote themselves, that's when the posts do really, really, really good. So, you know, the more promotion that you get and the more kind of dedicated followers that you have that will engage with you, the more that's going to um, uh, continue to grow your posts and your reach. Yeah. So having a good following is important, but having people who engage with you is going to be, is going to give you that further reach. I think um I, I think someone definitely touched I think Carrie touched upon this as well but um and I, I think it's I know it's hard to get popular with these kind of things and but what would you say is your most popular one because I remember when I blogged about cell yeah. nature science it was not intentional that one got me the most reads and I was like oh so crapping on cell nature science on public got me the most reads um I yeah. think that more often um so yeah what was your most read stuff was it COVID because I know you wrote yeah. about COVID as well so. Right. So I had three posts that were about COVID. So I, I blogged about hydroxychloroquine at the very beginning when Trump was like, you know, so I'm from the United States. This is why I brought up Trump a lot of times because it's on the mind. <laughs> um, if you couldn't tell from my accent. So um, hydroxychloroquine post did really well because it was, you know, a sexy topic at the moment. And um, the mathematical modeling and my post I did about COVID-19 and climate change did well. But all of that happened at the beginning of COVID-19. People are kind of tired about reading it now. The last few COVID posts I put out did not do well. Yep. Um, so those three posts did well. And then um, there were a few other posts that did pretty well that I can't think of right now. But I will say, like you said, sometimes the posts that do really well are the posts you didn't expect to. Um, so yeah, that is something that I've experienced as well. Yep. Yeah, I kind of had a suspicion that people would be um, sick of reading about COVID at some point as well. Yeah. So just be me, but um, I, I felt that might be general. Yeah. Anyone else has anything else? I, most of the postdocs here are from actually in America, so both Carmen's are actually in the U.S. right now. Um, so they can totally relate. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Yeah, but we're almost done. It's almost in the past, so yeah. yeah we don't want to think about. It. And Leanne, Leanne is also from from Virginia Tech, so she's she's also next to me, like forty minutes away. So yeah. we're here in the US. Yeah, and originally from the Netherlands, so all the Dutch stuff I can also relate to that was being talked about today. No, I think I think that's pretty much all we have for times and questions. But always feel free to reach out for the, to them or write for Carrie if you want to. I'm yeah. sure she's more than happy. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you very much, Jake, for chairing the session. Thanks to the speakers. You were amazing. And uh, we recorded this. And if you give us permission, we will put it on YouTube. And Elia, uh, our bio room organizer, he's taking care of the video editing um, for putting them to um, on YouTube. Kind of. Well, now you're working like crazy before the lockdown. So you're justified. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we will take a break next week. We don't have a, a session, but uh, we will be back in two weeks. So stay tuned on uh, our BioRoom uh, Twitter account because we also love Twitter. And uh, we'll see you soon. I hope you can join us um, next time, too. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. See you all. Thank Bye. you. Thank you have all. a good one. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.